The big C conservatives love her. The small C conservatives wish they had the onions to be more like her. She's Marilyn Gladue. Thanks for coming on PP Simmons Television. Hi, Michael. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Listen, the reason we have you on is because the conservative leader of Canada has resigned or is resigning, has announced his resignation in lieu of the party coming up with a new leader. You have thrown your hat into the ring, is that right? Well, no. In fact, uh, I'm at the stage of evaluating. Uh, we haven't seen the rules yet, so we need right. to know what the rules are, how much money we have to raise, right. and how many signatures, etc. And gauging support across the country, so that's where we're at. Right. Well, you've got a lot of support in your own riding. Um, you were elected first in 2015. You, I went to your Wikipedia page here because I want to make sure I had the facts right. Uh, you, right now, you're serving as the official opposition critic for health and chair for the Standing Committee on Status of Women. The official op opposition's critic for health is, is curious for me because about a year ago, I blew out my left knee and it took me six months to get an MRI and found out that I have a torn meniscus, which I, now I've been walking around with a torn meniscus for a year now and I still haven't heard from a surgeon. So this is the, this is the Canadian rationed healthcare that we have here in Canada. People around the world think, let's move to Canada because they have free healthcare. Well, no, we pay up front and then it's rationed out on a per need basis, right? And yet, so I wanna, I wanna ask you about the big C conservatism of, of the, the two-sided coin that is the fiscal conservatism and the social moral conservatism, mm -hmm. right? Because many people that I talk to around the country look at Andrew Scheer's failure to, to, uh, to become the Prime Minister of Canada to secure that seat, which was his to lose anyway, mm -hmm. in many people's opinions. And that's what we heard all over the press with the polls and everything. Like Andrew Scheer will be the next Prime Minister of Canada. But many people believe that he blew it because he failed to address the moral social concerns that the moral majority in Canada truly have. They see the decline of morality in this country. They see that 100,000 preborn babies are, are killed in the womb every year. They see that, uh, they see that uh, the, 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 the fear that they feel to confront the issues regarding the, the whole gay agenda in this country that Prime Minister Trudeau has said if you don't use the proper pronouns in so much as addressing people in the street the way they want you to address them, I have a lot of experience with that, my wife and I are foster parents, to transgender people. So we know the issues, we know our rights in our own home, but as soon as you leave your own home, everything changes. People have been locked up for so-called hate speech, for using the pronouns with people that they weren't born with. So. My question to you is, okay, let's start with Andrew Scheer. Where do you think he went wrong? What, what happened? Why, why did the whole thing just go up in flames like that? Well, I think there's a number of reasons, and certainly uh, John Barrett is doing a, a fulsome report on what went wrong and what we ought to do differently to win in Ontario and Quebec and in the Atlantic provinces. But clearly, Canadians uh, have indicated in the 2011 and the 2015, or sorry, the 2015 and the 2019 elections that they're looking for a better balance of fiscal responsibility and social compassion. So while they care about you know affordability and people are feeling the pinch in Canada. At the same time, what about health care? You've talked about health care. Uh, we have a crisis in our health care system yeah. in Canada, and we have an aging demographic. We have one in six seniors right now that will be one in four in the next 10 years. And so there's just not enough money in the system for the increase in chronic disease, the increase in dementia, the demands of palliative care. And someone needs to come with a plan and work with the provinces and territories on that. So I think Canadians clearly needed that. They also, um, I think, did not like the conservative plan for the environment. I think there was a lot of great ideas mm -hmm. in that plan, but it was not articulated in a way that people believed it would help us achieve our Paris targets or really take a leadership role in the world. So right. that's something to revisit. And then as you pointed out, um, Andrew's position on social issues wasn't well received in Quebec, certainly, and in other places in the country. And I think people are looking for a Prime Minister that will stand up for the rights and freedoms of all Canadians. Right. That's what's key. Um, not everyone's going to agree. Certainly in our party, we've got the full range of pro-choice to pro-life. 
and uh, various views, people that are more traditional in their uh, approach to marriage, people that are uh, openly gay. So we, we have the full range and I think we need to give people their rights and freedoms and you know uh, respect those and stand up for them. Yeah. You have been the health critic also in the past, right? Right, and I'm I want sorry, to correct I'm you. I'm not the chair for status of women anymore. I okay. was originally. Say Wikipedia here. is wrong, just saying. This has been. Okay. Has right, so you have a, a science background because you worked for Dow Chemical <clears throat> as an engineer, right? right? And you were, you've been a chair for the Canadian Society of Chemical Engineers. And so you have a science background. <clears throat> I'm the first female engineer actually in the House of Commons. So really? I'm, I'm very proud of that, and I was made a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Engineers and of Engineers Canada during uh, the last parliamentary session. Now, I had, since you have a science background, I had, uh, my, 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 my precious mother-in-law passed away a few years ago. I had the, <clears throat> the, um, the solemn duty of picking up her ashes at the funeral. And I got into a conversation with the funeral director, and, and he said, and he, so we started talking about the, the process of, of um, cremating someone, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, tell me about that. How does that work today? Like, is there a, an oven and so on? He says, no, 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 it's all done by computers. And they put the parameters for the person in the computer. And the computer sets the burn and everything. And um, I mean, I could I ask these questions. It's, it's something that, not something everybody would be able to ask a funeral director because if you're picking up the, the remains of your loved one, it would be hard to hear this stuff. I said, well, tell me something. What do they put into the computer when they're gonna cremate someone? And he said, well, they put in the, their height and their weight and, their, and their, their gender and so on. I said, wait a minute. They put their gender in the computer? And he says, yeah, they, they have to put their gender in because females have, 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 uh, have uh, less bone density. Mm -hmm. their, their skin is 30% thinner. So we have to know the gender. I said, wait a minute now. If Bruce Jenner, now known as Caitlyn Jenner, was to die in Sarnia and need to be cremated, would he or she be cremated as a female or a male? He said she would have to be cremated as a male because otherwise it, it wouldn't work. So even in death, we know that chromosomes, according to Bill Nye from the 80s, the 80s version of Bill Nye said that chromosomes determine gender. Now we find out that your death, your burial determines your gender, not everything going on in between. I've had police officers in this community tell me that uh, people who are in this trans, the young people tra in the transgender community in this area every one of them is suffering from some sort of mental uh, blockage or family dysfunction or, or uh, something that for me tells me that we need to love these people mm -hmm. into a state of mental health and not give in to these, these uh, whims and desires to, okay, I want to mutilate my body because I don't feel like a boy or I don't feel like a girl. Why do you suppose it is that, I'm, I'm not trying to back you into a corner here because it is my position that we couch all of this conversation from a position of love, mm -hmm. that we love them. It just feels to me like we've given up on loving these people properly and saying, going from saying you need help to become mentally healthy to just do whatever you want, we don't care anymore. Well, certainly I haven't given up on uh, loving everyone. That's right, the sure. job. Yeah. Um, but I would say that it, it is quite common. 85% of uh, transgender folks do suffer with mental health issues. And, you know, you can argue about, uh, you know, whether it's because of the rejection they experience or other trauma in their life. But uh, the reality is we do need to provide help and support for people. And uh, there, there is a lot of uh, shaming. I know when I was the chair of Status of Women, we studied violence against uh, women and girls and against transgender and uh, LBGTQ folks. Huge amount of violence in our country and obviously we want to get to a place where everyone is respected and uh, treated and as you said, loved. Is it important though that we, we as a truly conservative government, take a step back and say, wait a minute, we need to just hold off on prescribing the hormones and, and the surgeries and just do more mental evaluations, merit-based evaluations on where are they at emotionally and what's their family structure like and we do more digging into that or do we just write them a blank check on all these hormones and, and surgeries and so on? Well, I would argue it's, it's, I'm a fan of freedom. I'm not a fan of the government getting involved in every aspect yeah. of your life and yeah. so uh, we give people the, the right to live how they want. And uh, you know whether or not they're going to uh, pay for surgeries and pay for hormone treatments, that's a provincial jurisdiction. And in some provinces, you know, we see that they provide that service and in other provinces not today. Yeah, yeah.
Okay. Let's get to the fiscal stuff here. The Financial Post reported recently that uh, the Canadian government lost 71,200 jobs in November. Mm -hmm. How is that possible when the United States uh, uh, economy is, is going so fast, so hard, so furious, creating record numbers of jobs, record numbers of jobs for every demographic, mm -hmm. blacks, Hispanics, women, men, everybody, mm -hmm can get a job in the United States. That's right. We are tied at the hip to that economy. <clears throat> As the American economy goes, so should our economy go. Absolutely. Why is this number a reality well, in this country? So we lost 71,000 <clears throat> jobs and the U.S. gained 256,000 jobs. And that is evidence of how Justin Trudeau is destroying the economy in Canada. Thank you. I mean, he's killing the natural resource sector. We've seen oil and gas. They've lost hundreds of thousands of jobs. We've lost $80 billion of investment. Foreign investment has fallen by 50%. The softwood lumber uh, sector is another natural resource sector where for five years under the Liberals we've had no, no softwood lumber contract. We've got uh, punishing tariffs and mills are shutting down. Nothing done on the Liberal side there. Then we see that um, in terms of creating a competitive business climate, um, there is nothing but uncertainty. Bill C-69, the No More Pipelines Bill, and C-48, the uh, Tanker Ban Bill, and a number of other regulations that have been put in place are uh, punishing and not competitive with what's going on in the U.S. So companies are choosing not to come to Canada, mm. and um, we have to fix that. We have to restore a competitive business climate. We need to put in place um, a, a less bureaucratic regulation. And we need to provide the certainty that investors need in order to come and uh, build and provide jobs in Canada. Right. People don't trust the current government. Well, I mean, in, in it's not a charity. A lot of businesses are right. here to make exactly. money. So if you have a carbon tax, for example, here in Canada, and you don't have one in the U.S., we know locally, for example, Nova Chemicals had an opportunity to build their plant here and build their plant in the U.S. And I had to uh, have multiple interventions with the Environment Minister, Catherine McKenna at the time, in order for her to incentivize Nova to stay here because it was not a competitive deal. Um, she had difficulty to understand. They have no corporate tax in Texas. They have mm -hmm. no carbon tax. Mm -hmm. If you want to compete with that, you're going to mm -hmm. have to make a deal. So that's what we need to Where do. Where were you when Shell was trying to expand and that whole thing went down the toilet because of environmental stuff? Well, in fact, I was uh, an engineer at the time before right. I got into politics yeah. and I was working on the, the <clears throat> Shell expansion. But again, what the governments do has an influence. And right now there's a clean fuel tax that will cost refineries in Sarnia uh, three to four billion dollars a year. So Imperial Oil, Suncor, and Shell are all going to uh, be very punished. Wow. And if you want to keep those kind of jobs in Canada, um, something needs to be done. You have a science background. What would your conservative government do vis-a-vis -vis the carbon tax situation? Well, I think in some instances, the carbon tax ship has sailed. A lot of provinces have put those things in place already in Quebec, in BC, now Jason Kenney in Alberta. And so what the provinces have in place um, would be costly and difficult to undo. I would not continue down that road at all mm -hmm. because a carbon tax is a totally ineffective way to reduce emissions. Europe has had a carbon tax for 19 years and they've only reduced emissions by 8%. So certainly that's totally inadequate to meet the targets that have been stated, and there are better ways to get there. I think um, providing a regulatory regime with incentives for companies that are the large industrial emitters to actually uh, put in the technology to reduce their emissions, mm -hmm. that's a starting point. We know that the top three sources in Canada of emissions are major industrial emitters, transportation, and buildings. So there's something to be done then in the transportation industry to uh, you know, invest in rail, get cars off the road, address diesel uh, truck uh, fume emissions, and then to look at greening of building codes and how we go forward with um, you know, emissions from buildings. Really, Canada is less than 1.6% of the total footprint of the world. So we could eliminate the whole thing and it wouldn't matter. Right. That said, let's take a leadership role here and then let's leverage those excellent solutions to create jobs for Canadians and help other countries like China and India, emerging nations and the United States to re reduce their footprint, thereby actually helping reduce the carbon footprint of the world. Otherwise, we're going to be receiving the results 
flooding, wildfires, and um, you know, there's nothing really we can do about it with a small footprint contribution we have. Do you see a, a part to play in, uh, in the, from the commercial sector? Because there's a company in British Columbia named Carbon Engineering. You know the company? I know uh, of this company. <coughs> Canada has got multiple innovative technologies, yeah. carbon sequestration. Mm -hmm. We've got all kinds of uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction that's been done uh, across the country. Green, clean tech companies that are mm -hmm. coming forward. Right. All kinds of new technologies. These are the things that we need to be um, marketing, you know, uh, getting uh, the government uh, or venture capital funding behind and leveraging to places like China and India that are increasing their footprint, uh, you know, at this time they're not decreasing. And it seems to me like the people who are truly benefiting from the, the carbon tax structure the way it is, while leaving out the, 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 the business community too late. Like, Carbon engineering in British Columbia, I mean, I'm not a spokesman for them. I just think it's amazing what they've done. They've created a, a system w which captures carbon from the atmosphere, turns it into usable fuel. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's amazing what they've done. They've upscaled it to, to industrial levels. Let's start promoting that part of the, of, the, of the solution to the problem. Because I see it as an anti-pollution message. Mm -hmm. If they would have come out, if Al Gore would have come out with an anti-pollution campaign, everybody would have been on board. Because even the Bible says, that one of the reasons God is c coming back to judge the planet is because of people who pollute the earth. That's, you know, that's on the list of reasons why he's going to judge this earth. So we need to be good stewards of this planet. Stop polluting the planet should be the message, right? Not uh, polar bears and, and, and ice and give us money. Al Gore has substantially enriched his pockets through this carbon tax system. Well, and I think that, you know, we've got to come from a place of uh, giving ourselves warm, fuzzy feelings about what we're doing and actually take concrete action to solve the problem. Thank I mean, you. this is my engineering background right. coming out. But, you know, it, it does nothing to have somebody, um, you know, in Canada uh, making a big deal about plastic straws. In Canada, that is not the plastics pollution problem. It's right. microbeads in the Great Lakes. Right. It's the fact that we um, collect plastics and we only recycle nine percent of them these are the kind of things that are the actual facts and right. so to get down to the what is the problem that we're trying to address and what are the concrete solutions to come fix it i'm on your page i think um, and we have a whole generation of people that want to see less pollution yeah, sure that has to start with the individual right. when i was growing up granted it was a long time ago but uh, um, if you littered you were shamed by everybody, all your whole peer group. That's yeah. gone away. People feel free now to dump their Tim Hortons cups here, there, and everywhere, and their bottles as well. Yeah. And, and so we need to come to a stewardship attitude, and I think we need to come uh, with real solutions to a real problem and not just right. things that make us feel good. Right. Okay, two more questions. Yeah. I know you have to go. You're a busy person. CBC Radio has, they spend a billion five every year. A billion dollars of that comes from you and me comes directly out of our pocket. I just looked at the numbers again this morning. Okay. These are numbers are accurate. Okay, you can see I it see right, it right here. there, yeah. Uh, it's here, so, yeah, here it is right here, right? Million, yeah. So almost a billion dollars. Now we're, we're a country of 34 million, uh, million people, mm -hmm. okay? We're spending a billion dollars on a radio station. I tuned into CBC no, Radio. It's, it's actually the combination, I think. Well, the, the, the television is, it, they're allowed to do um, advertisements and so on. Where the radio station is not. They don't do any advertising at all, except for political campaigns. They're required by law to do it. But other than that, they don't do any fundraising. We just hand them a billion dollars a year, every year. And the reason I'm so agitated about this is because I have been now, it took me six months to get an MRI. I could have got one the same day in Port Huron. It would have cost me $2,000. But I could have done it the same day in Port Huron. Why are we spending a thousand MRI machines every year for a radio station? Now I know there's some act that was passed that allows them to do this. I believe, it's my opinion, and you can give your opinion on this, it's my opinion that we need to defund CBC and I think that this was a primary message of the People's Party of Canada. We're going to defund, not get rid of them, defund them so that they can go out and take a poll, okay? If you want us to stay here on your radio sh stations, um, you need to give us money, like your donations, mm -hmm. tax-deductible donations like NPR does, and keep us on the air. 
if you don't want us on the air anymore, this is a referendum now, don't give us money, we'll just go away and get real jobs, you know, instead of being on welfare, which is what this radio station basically amounts to. Uh, talking heads on welfare. That's what they are, in my opinion, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I was a big CBC fan for much of my adolescent life, and now I see that they need to just go away. And, and, be, and you know, the thing that troubles me the most is it's mostly the elderly who are listening to this because young people like my son, who's 20, and myself even, I'm 50, I don't listen to CBC. I listen to podcasts. I, everything's done through the internet now for people, young people like you and me and my son, right? So, and yet it's the elderly who are suffering the most from the rationing of the health care and they're not getting proper uh, uh, health assignments from doctors and so on. They're waiting too long for, for cancer care and, and MRIs for my knee and I'm in pain all the time now because of my knee. Why is that? And yet we're giving a thousand MRI machines. Life extending medical equipment could be purchased with this billion dollars a year, that's a lot of money, to a radio station. I mean, this to, to many people, myself included, this is an abomination. All right, so uh, I mean, there's lots in what you said. Let's start with, first of all, it's priorities, priorities of spending. Uh, definitely healthcare needs to be a higher priority. And we gotta look at all of the places that we're pouring money that could be poured into the healthcare system and, and think about that. Now, with respect to CBC, I'm not on your page uh, that we should eliminate it because the purpose of having the CBC is to make sure that Canadian content is delivered across the nation. And for companies that are profit-based, you know, there's a lot of the rural and remote places that would not receive anything. Mm -hmm. And so that is the purpose of a publicly funded CBC. That said, under the Liberal government, they've increased their reach and their funding by billions of dollars, not just in the radio, but in the television. Mm -hmm. And that makes um, them sort of dominant and uh, other networks like CTV and those that are profit-based are having difficulty competing with CBC because now they're in an overreach situation. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that giving um, $600 million to the media in the middle of an election campaign campaign is um, at the very least looks like uh, trying to influence mm -hmm. and, and was really not a good idea so yeah. I think that's undemocratic and we shouldn't see that again but uh, CBC does have a role to play that said I, I, I definitely think that uh, we need to make sure that they're doing the role that we need them to play which is to deliver Canadian content across the country make sure that the content is unbiased if this is being done with public tax dollars, Thank you, then, exactly. then I can't look at CBC and watch what's happening in Ottawa and see all the time that they're defending the Prime Minister regardless of whether what he does right? is right or wrong. And they're always criticizing the Conservatives <laughs> regardless of whether what they do is right or wrong. I think the job of the media is to report accurately on what's happening sure. and let Canadians make the choice. And so especially when they're funded with uh, public dollars, that would be my tact. Absolutely, because it's my money too. Well, it's everyone's money, and there's everyone's got a different political view, and so we can't right. have them skewed in one direction mm -hmm. um, with public dime. Yeah, like David Suzuki has way too much clout at the CBC. David Suzuki has enriched himself using taxpayer money, another man on welfare, and yet they don't represent all Canadians. In fact, I would say that they only represent maybe 20% of Canadians through their, the, they become like the, I don't expect you to agree with this at all, but the Goebbels style mouthpiece for the Socialist Party of Canada. Because the Nazi Party was a Socialist Party. And Goebbels was the mouthpiece for the propaganda wing of the Nazi Party. So I've, all, 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 so I've likened this whole CBC situation to that milieu that was happening back then. That we have this socialist government that's pushing their agenda on the people constantly, constantly, constantly. And the CBC is the mouthpiece for that agenda, it seems like. Well, like clearly I'm not, I'm not on your page, Thank there. that's, and that's extreme. Be. But what I would say is if we look at um, communist nations, yeah. we see that they control the media, okay? So this is a dangerous thing. In a democracy, you don't want to see that. And so um, I'm not saying that the liberals are controlling the media, but when they're giving them billions of dollars and $600 million in an election year, 
to say nice things about them. And if you look, I'm a statistician by nature, so I tend to look every day and look at the number of articles that are out there and the percent that are you know accurate, the percent that are biased, and uh, I'm concerned. Uh, and I think Canadians you. should be concerned. So we need, to, be, we need to make sure that the public dollars that go um, come with the same kind of criteria that are applied in business. Our right. businesses are not allowed to be partisan in nature. Right. And so that should be the same criteria, in my view, applied to the media. And you know, it's interesting what you just said about communism because Karl Marx in his manifesto made, he used the words communism and socialism interchangeably. He saw no daylight between the two. Socialism is, for all intents and purposes, communism light. You know, the, the government I, controls how much we pay people, how much time we have to take off, how much time, we, how much time truck drivers have to take 10 hours off every night. I mean, who, what adult sleeps 10 hours a night? I don't. You probably don't. Well, no, I definitely don't. Um, I, one thing I would say is, it seems to me that we have a whole generation um, in Canada of young people who don't understand why communism isn't okay. It's bad, right. And I've had a lot of questions <laughs> asked to me to say, well, what's wrong with communism? And so we need to point to you know, what's happening over in Hong Kong right now, right. Um, you know, and, the, and the, the people rising up because the, you know, they're going to uh, basically be extradited back to China and they know that that won't go well with them because if you disagree with the government of the day, then you know, typically you are arrested and potentially executed. And so that's what's wrong with communism. And, and I think educating Canadians on you know, what we have in the rest of the world and what is valuable in our democracy is important. Because freedom is key. This is one of the, the, the best things about Canada. It's the reason a lot of people want to come to Canada. And so we have mm. to protect our freedoms in Canada. Right. And that means everybody's freedoms, not just certain special interest groups' freedoms. Mm. It's the freedoms of all Canadians to believe what they want, express what they want, the freedom of the press. All of these things contribute to that kind of freedom, which is key. Okay. For the record, uh, Marilyn Gladder does not believe that Canada has a Goebbels-style propaganda wing of the Liberal Party. She does not believe that. Those are believe Mike Seussman's words. <laughs> Last Correct. question. This is, the, this is the question that made Maxime Bernier so popular with the people. Not popular enough, obviously, but popular nonetheless. He did lose his own seat. Yes. So, yes. Uh, immigration. Mm -hmm. We have people coming to Canada. I was at a Tim Hortons in Woodstock the other day. I walked in. It was at the service plaza, the westbound service plaza. I walk in. There is 20 people behind the counter working at Tim Hortons. None of them speaking English. None of them are ethnically Canadian, right? I'm ethnically, what, what is ethnic Canadian? It's really just, it's a meaningless term, really, because we're all immigrants. <clears throat> and, and I think at the end of the day, we should all welcome people to our country, right? <clears throat> Especially since we don't have a replacement birth rate and we haven't had one for the last 40 years in this country. Right. We need people, we need workers, we need innovators, we need thinkers. We need people to create the next best MRI machine, for example. The, the, the next best thing that will take us to space and other planets and so on. We need these people, we need Canada to be the country that welcomes these people, right? But the Paul Revere Society, they define a country as borders, language, and country. If you eliminate your borders, you have no country. Uh, I'm sorry, borders, language, and culture. Mm -hmm. If you have no borders, no country. No common language that we all can speak and understand each other and get along and and what did you say you want to rob me what, what is, I don't understand what you're saying like like we need to know what other what everyone else is saying right what are you saying about me what am I saying about you you and I understand each other I've been on phone calls with people trying to fix my trying to get the twelve 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 to stop flashing on my VCR it's a poor example and I can't understand the word this person is saying on the phone to me. That's a problem. That's why language is a major, it's like a three-legged stool. You take what the borders out, the stool falls over. You take the language out, the stool falls over. You take the culture out, the stool falls over, right? It seems to me that the culture, the Canadian culture, the thing that makes Canada great, mm -hmm. the historical values that we've had in this country are not being eroded, but have com been completely eroded, in my opinion. I travel around this entire country all the time. And I don't see Canada, I see the Canadian way of life as being on life support, and evidence for that is the firing of Don Cherry, who simply called on people to put uh, a poppies on their lapel to uh, celebrate, mourn, um, and remember 
the people who gave their lives so that we can have this freedom that you've been talking about for the last half hour, he gets fired because that is inappropriate speech in this country now. Have, has, has Canada lost its moorings? Are we? Where do you stand on the whole immigration debate? Where should we be with respect to that? Why are there all these tent cities in Quebec now? And why are now they're all enraged by it? What, where do you, where, what's your big picture thinking on all that? So I would say uh, Canada's always had immigration and we need immigration. You pointed that out yourself. And um, while you said you wanted to be welcoming, I think the comments about the people working at Tim Hortons, you don't know if they're Canadians or if they're not. But I, I think what we need to do is we have to have fair and compassionate immigration. But we need to focus in certain areas. First of all, economic immigration. Um, we want to have people to come and fill the jobs and the skill sets that we're missing in Canada. And those people can begin work and they can begin you know, paying taxes and helping to contribute right. to building a better country. I think we want to make sure that people can be reunited with their families. So we have lots of people that are here that want to have their families come over. They're willing to help support them. And in the past, that's how people came over. They paid their own way. They had their families support them. They got jobs and they contributed. And that's what we want. What we don't want to have is what we have today, where we have 50,000 people that have crossed illegally into our country, and the taxpayer is paying to keep those people here for three or four years while their claims are heard. 60% um, of them uh, currently uh, aren't eligible to apply, and so we're paying for them to stay here, and then uh, they need to be deported. We're not deporting them at a reasonable rate. And instead of um, building tent cities, and uh, you know, encouraging them to come in, we should be, be uh, updating the Safe Third Country Agreement to say, if you cross anywhere other than um, a regular port of entry in Canada, we're not going to pay to support you. We're not going to give you free health care. Thank you. I mean, they're crossing in Quebec and Manitoba. Why are they not crossing in Ontario? Well, because they don't get free health care, they don't get free legal aid, they don't get free, you know, they're not, they're not uneducated about what the benefits are. So we want to have immigration and we want to make sure that the immigrants that are coming fill the skill gaps, are reuniting with families, and um, when they come, if we want to maintain a culture that respects freedoms, then we have to train people about Canada. If they come from uh, places for example, that don't have laws that line up to Canada's laws. Equality of women as a, a classic example. I would see this as somebody that traveled through the globe and was in many countries where I did not have a status. Mm. You have people that come from that country here and you don't give them any orientation. You know, you're going to find some of the, the issues that we did see um, with increases in domestic violence and things like that because people don't know that in Canada it's illegal. You cannot beat your wife. You cannot do things that, for example, are, are common in other countries. And so uh, with respect to language, the liberals um, took out the criteria that you have to speak English or French in order to be a Canadian citizen. They took that out. They took that out. Wow. Okay. So That's that, you know, that was know that. unbelievable. Yeah. And they also um, have changed the requirements about how long you actually have to stay in Canada to keep, you know, your citizenship. Yeah. Uh, you have it forever now. Right. And you can be away, you know, uh, four years out of six. And, and so that is not, in my view, what we want to have. We want to have people come to Canada, stay in Canada, live in Canada. We don't want to have people that actually are living somewhere else and only come back when they need our health care system. Mm -hmm. And these are some of the concerns that have been expressed. So yeah. let's, let's be welcoming. Um, let's make sure that when people come, that we in integrate them into Canadian society and help them understand how to do that. And that's really all I was saying about the Tim Hortons thing. It wasn't that I was questioning their Canadian citizenship or whatever. Mm -hmm. What I was saying was, on one side of the counter, we have these people that were interacting with each other, speaking English. On the other side of the counter, nobody was speaking English. Sure. But I would tell you, as a person who's talked to you know, people locally, for yeah. example, they will tell you that folks that are coming here in Sarnia, we have a lot of folks from India and Pakistan that have arrived. Um, they are reliable. They show up on time. Right. They work hard. Sure. And they're having not the same experience with people that are homegrown. They want every weekend off. They can't be showing up on time. They're on their Facebook <laughs> all the time. And, and you know, they don't have the same work the ethic. Like so, that, you know, yeah. I think that there, you know, there is something that to be learned from that as well. Right, right, right. And also, I, I am not advocating that we get rid of CBC. I'm saying that we need a referendum on CBC. And it has to be a, a tied to finances. 
that we have to stop pumping a billion dollars into a radio. I mean, a billion dollars. That's a thousand. I can't get off this topic, Marilyn. I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. I, I just want you to know that it's more than a billion dollars. I don't want to inflame the situation. Yeah, I'm just looking at the you know, but there was, over here. There was a certain number that was given, and then when the Liberal government came in in the last parliament, they increased what they increased gave to it. CBC by one and a half billion. Oh. And then on top of that, there was the $600 uh, million dollars that didn't all go to CBC, but uh, right. certainly a share of that went there. And so it's uh, billions. It's, it's lots billions. Of it's lots of money. Ugh. It's thousands of MRI machines a year being pumped into a radio station, which is irrelevant, in my opinion, to the vast majority of Canadians. They do not speak my language. Anyway, you've given us an, a, more time than, than, Tons than, of food than we thought. thought. And, and so I appreciate you coming on. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. Marilyn Gladue, everybody. still doesn't know. Former Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon has died aged eight. We are with one of Rabbi Kaduri's disciples.